All right, welcome to The Explainer. Today, we're going to piece together a fascinating story from the world of digital finance. It's a story that has it all. Conflict, incredible technological leaps, and some billion-dollar bets on what's coming next. We're going to connect the dots between a political fight brewing in Washington, a completely mind-bending tech breakthrough, and the quiet, calculated moves being made by some of Wall Street's biggest players. So why are the world's biggest banks so afraid of digital dollars? To get to the bottom of that, we've got to look at this high-stakes battle that's heating up as we speak, a battle for your money. You know, on one side, you've got the entire traditional banking system, and on the other, you have this new form of digital money that, well, it threatens to upend everything they've built. So Act 1 here is all about a direct confrontation. It really is a classic story, right? An established power sees a new technology coming over the horizon and decides to do everything it can to protect its turf. The incumbents? The banks. The challenger? Something called a stablecoin. Okay, so before we dive into the fight, we need to know what they're actually fighting about. A stablecoin, well, it's pretty much a digital version of a dollar. It lives on a blockchain, but unlike something like Bitcoin, its value is built to stay stable, pegged one-to-one -one with a currency like the U.S. dollar. It's kind of like having digital cash that you can send as easily as you send an email. You see, the banks saw these things as a major, major threat. For years, you've gotten basically zero interest on your bank deposits, right? But suddenly, stablecoins show up offering real, attractive returns. So the banks lobbied hard and they got a law passed to limit them, thinking, OK, problem solved. We'll just ban the issuers from giving you yield directly. But it wasn't solved. And what happened next was this incredible cat and mouse game. The stablecoin issuers, companies like Circle, they just did a clever little pivot. They partnered up with exchanges like Coinbase, who could then offer the yield to users instead. It was a brilliant workaround. And now, you guessed it, the banks are back, screaming to the government, close this loophole, go after their partners too. And this quote really just hits the nail on the head. This is about way more than just a little competition. This is a fundamental threat to the entire banking business model. It's a fancy word called disintermediation, basically cutting out the middleman. Banks make money by taking our deposits, paying us next to nothing for them, and then lending that money out for a much higher rate. If we can all earn a good, safe yield on a digital dollar somewhere else, that whole model just collapses. An exodus of deposits isn't just a problem for them. It's an existential threat. So while all this political drama was happening, something absolutely massive was brewing under the surface, on the tech side. I'm talking about a technological tsunami that was building. This wasn't some tiny little improvement. This was a shockwave that really changes the entire game. For years, the big knock against blockchains like Ethereum was speed. I mean, the main network, the base layer that provides all the security, can only handle about 30 transactions per second. 30. For perspective, Visa does thousands. For a global financial system, that's just a non-starter. It has been the biggest bottleneck holding this whole thing back. And that limitation has been the key argument against crypto ever scaling up. But here's the thing. What if we were all looking at it the wrong way? What if that slow, super secure base layer was never supposed to be the super highway? What if it was always meant to be the bedrock foundation, something you could build on top of to go much, much faster? Well, get this. Just recently, the entire Ethereum ecosystem, that's the main network, plus all the new tech built on top of it, hit a staggering peak. Not 100 transactions per second, not 1,000, but 24,000 transactions per second. Let that sink in. That's not just a leap forward, it's a completely new reality. Just look at this chart. It puts everything into perspective, right? That little bar on the left, that's the old world the speed limit we all thought we were stuck with. And that towering bar on the right? That's what's possible right now. It is an absolutely exponential jump in what this network can do. So you're probably asking, how on earth is that possible? Well, it's all thanks to something called Layer 2s or L2s. And this analogy on screen is perfect. Think of the main Ethereum network as that slow, steady country road. It's not fast, but it is incredibly secure and reliable. The L2s are like massive multi-lane superhighways that we've built on top of it, allowing for insane speed while still being anchored to the security of that original road. 
Okay, so how does this magic actually work? These layer twos use a really clever technology called roll-ups to get that speed without giving up security. Think of it like a super efficient carpool lane for your transactions. A project called Lighter, which uses some really advanced tech, is one of the main drivers of this huge spike. It bundles thousands of fast, cheap transactions together and then records a single summarized transaction on the super secure main network. You get the best of both worlds, the speed of the superhighway with the security of the original road. And that security is the key to everything. I mean, why are developers so confident building these super highways on Ethereum? Because the main network has been running for over a decade. It has never been halted because of a bug. That's the kind of rock-solid, reliable foundation you can actually build a new digital economy on. Okay, so we've got a political war over digital money and a mind-blowing tech breakthrough that makes it all usable at a global scale. That brings us to our final act, the validation. In other words, where is the smart money going? What are the big players doing? First up, let's talk about a company called MicroStrategy. These guys aren't just dipping their toes in the water. They have gone all in on Bitcoin. And they haven't just been buying it. They've engineered this brilliant financial machine designed to just acquire more and more and more of it. So here's their brilliant strategy broken down. It's like a machine. They go out and sell a product to investors who just want a nice steady yield, say around 10%. Then they take all that cash and plow it straight into Bitcoin. As long as Bitcoin's price goes up by more than the 10% they owe their investors, they make a profit. It's an incredibly clever way to use other people's money to just keep stacking more Bitcoin. But look, this isn't just about one crypto-focused company. The big dogs on Wall Street, the ones who were skeptical for years, they're not just watching anymore. They're running the numbers, publishing their research, and they're making some seriously bold predictions about the future. And this is a really big one. We're talking about JP Morgan. Yeah, that JP Morgan. Their analyst recently came out and said they see Bitcoin hitting $170,000. And not in five years, in the next six to 12 months. This isn't some random person on the internet. This is Wall Street royalty. Now, the actual number is almost less important than who's saying it. When a giant like J.P. Morgan puts out a forecast like this, it's like a giant green light for the rest of the financial world. It gives other big, conservative institutions, we're talking pension funds, endowments, the cover they need to finally start allocating serious money to this space. It is a powerful signal of validation. So when you step back and you connect all these dots, you've got this desperate political fight over digital dollars. You've got this insane technological leap in speed that makes it all possible. And you've got Wall Street giants placing these huge bets. It all leads you to this one big provocative question. Are these just separate interesting stories or are they all pieces of a much bigger puzzle? Are we watching the replacement of finance as we know it? Or are we just witnessing its next and maybe its most profound evolution? Don't forget to subscribe, and thanks for watching.